than a wicked in hip hop. So uh, today's lecture is going to be about query execution. This is the first of two parts. So we're going to cover um, the basics in, in today's class. In the next class, we'll look at uh, parallel query execution. So uh, before we get started, just a, a quick uh, rundown of all the, the stuff you guys have pending. Um, so again, project number two is going to be due um, on the Sunday following the midterm. So the midterm exam is going to be next week um, on Wednesday, October 13th, just in, in class during the regular class time. Um, I, I, we went through all this stuff uh, uh, in the last class, and it's also all covered in, in the exam guide. I think there was a question about um, whether or not there would be a, a practice exam, uh, yeah, we'll, we will um, uh, put out a, a practice exam from one of the previous years um, by, by tonight. So you, you'll have a chance to look at that uh, in preparing for next week's midterm. So uh, again, just, just kind of remember you have to budget your time um, between the midterm, studying for the midterm, and the, the project, which is going to be due uh, shortly thereafter. So are there any questions about administrative stuff before uh, we, we jump into the material? Okay, so uh, just a, a quick recap. Um, so we've, we've talked about this in the past. A query plan uh, is basically uh, this, this collection of operators that we have in our uh, DBMS, and they're arranged in a tree. Uh, technically, again, it's a, a directed acyclic graph, but for our purposes, everything we're, we're going to talk about is a, a tree structure. So you can um, uh, translate one of these SQL queries in the way that the DBMS is going to execute it is by translating a SQL query to some kind of um, logical plan. So the uh, logical plan corresponding to the SQL query uh, shown on the slide is, is uh, right here in the, the um, right below it. And uh, uh, basically what's going to happen is the uh, uh, query is going to go through this, uh, these different steps. So we're going to start by translating the SQL to the logical plan, and then the logical plan is then going to be uh, translated again to a physical plan. And the physical plan is where we take uh, each of the operators and we decide which, uh, what the physical implementation of that operator is going to be. So for example, uh, in this, this join operator here that joins R and S together, uh, we need to decide how we're going to do that. Are we going to use um, a nested loop join? Are we going to use a hash join, sort merge join, that kind of stuff. So um, we're, we're starting out with this high level logical plan and we need to translate that to the actual physical implementation of the operators that are going to, to execute the plan. So again, the way we want to think about this is that data, uh, the, the data in our database is flowing from the leaves of the tree. So at, at the bottom we see uh, a table scan on R and S. So the, the data is going to flow from the leaves of the tree all the way up towards the root. And then once you get to the root, the root is going to materialize the final um, uh, query output that we're expecting. So in this case, we're going to get back the results from the, the select clause, uh, the RID, and the, the s.c date that, that we requested in the query. So kind of that's, that's uh, thinking about what we're, we're doing at a high level. And uh, we, we've kind of been talking about the different um, uh, implementations of operators. We talked about, you know, specifically how to implement a join, how to implement sorting, how to implement an aggregation, all that stuff. We've been we've been speaking about those in isolation so far, and in this class, hopefully, uh, you're, you're going to uh, see how and understand how everything kind of fits together uh, to go from the individual operator implementations that we have all the way up to the final query result that we're going to get by executing this uh, SQL query. So just a, a high level um, overview of what we're going to cover in today's class. Uh, we're going to start out by talking about the, the different processing models we have available to us. So how actually we're going to uh, implement the, the passing of, of results between query operators as we stitch them together. 
Uh, we're going to uh, revisit access methods. I know we talked a little bit about some of the different options, uh, table scans, index scans, that kind of stuff. Um, we, we, we talked a little bit about those in previous lectures, but today we're going to revisit those and expand on them a little bit. Um, modification queries, so you know, typically we think about read queries, how we can retrieve data from the database, but it's equally as important to figure out you know, how we're going to execute uh, inserts, updates, and deletes to our database. So uh, those are an important consideration and they, they differ from um, read queries a little bit. And then finally we're going to talk about expression evaluation. So you can kind of have uh, arbitrarily complex expressions or logic in your where clause, project clause, whatever. Um, but the idea is that uh, we need a way to evaluate these arbitrarily complex expressions. You know, you could be uh, doing adding things together, modifying values uh, from a column, multiplications, all these different things. And then the comparisons that need to happen, and, and we need to be able to support um, in arbitrary uh, uh, conditions in our, in our evaluation logic. So uh, let's start off with the processing model. So basically, a, a DBMS's processing model tells us how the system is going to execute a particular query plan. And maybe that sounds a little uh, broad, but kind of the, the, the high-level idea is that there are different ways that we can implement uh, passing results between different query operators. We have each operator implemented in isolation, and now we need to, we need to move uh, intermediate results between the operators. So we're going to look at three different approaches here. Um, they each have different trade-offs depending on uh, primarily the workload, but for, for the overall system design. So we're going to talk about um, kind of the, the different cases where one approach might be preferable over another. So uh, again, each, each has different advantages and disadvantages. We want to be mindful in designing the system uh, which, which particular approach we're going to choose. So probably the uh, most common and most famous uh, approach is called the iterator model. Uh, sometimes it's also called uh, volcano style query processing after uh, there is an influential um, kind of research or academic system that, that popularized this model. It, it uh, existed, existed prior to, to the volcano system, but um, it, it kind of popularized the model and formalized the different um, uh, aspects of the approach that, that became commonplace in, in system design. So uh, you, you may see it referred to as volcano style processing. You may also see it referred to as uh, a pipeline query processing, which we'll see why in a second. But uh, basically the idea is that each query plan operator that we're going to implement, so whether it's a scan or a join or a sort or whatever, whatever the, the operator that we're implementing it is, needs to uh, also implement this next function. So we need to, to create some uh, function called next that the, the operator uh, needs to implement. And then on each invocation of the next function, the operator is going to return either a, a single tuple or uh, if it's run out of tuples, it has no more tuples to process, let's say it's a table scan. So you start at the beginning, uh, you're going along, emitting tuples, and then you get to the end, you want to return some kind of null marker to let the, the, um, whoever is calling your iterator know that, that you're out of tuples. So uh, basically this just executes in a loop that keeps calling next on, on the uh, children in the query plan. So remember we have that tree. Uh, each node can have potentially uh, multiple children. So you're going to keep calling next on the children in the query plan until uh, they return this null operator signifying that they're done. And then you for your operator can return null to uh, any, any parent nodes uh, that are calling next to you. So we'll see a visual example of how this works. Uh, again, we have the same, same query here uh, and the, the visual query plan. So if you imagine what's going on inside each one of these operators at, at a very high level, we have this uh, loop that's essen essentially implementing the uh, next function call for each operator. So if we look at you know, the top, uh, which is the, performing the projection, it's essentially saying, for every, every tuple t produced by my child node iterator, 
So it's going to be calling whoever the, the child is. In this case, it's the, the join operation. But for every uh, tuple t that's produced by the child iterator, we want to emit the projection function. And in this case, the projection function is just returning uh, the, the RID and the S value. So you can kind of see how these are all chained together. Uh, the, the projection calls the join. Now the join, recall, has these two parts. There's the build phase and the probe phase. So for the, the first piece, uh, the, um, uh, the first for loop in there is going to be, be calling uh, the uh, iterator of the child that's on the uh, outer side of the join, so the one that we're, we're uh, building the hash table for. So for every tuple produced by the, the left side of the join, we're going to be building up this hash table. And then once that's done, um, we've materialized our full hash table. Then we start calling the iterator for the right side of the join, and that's going to start probing the hash table. And of course, if there's a, a probe match, you know, if the probe succeeds, then we're, we will emit the joined tuple. And then, you know, as we continue further and further down, uh, the, the selection operator on the right side there is just filtering out uh, all of the S tuples that don't match the predicate S, S dot value is greater than 100. And then each of the, the base, uh, the, the leaf nodes in the uh, query plan are just basic table scans. So they're just saying for every single tuple in R, we want to emit that tuple. Or every, every single tuple in S, we want to emit that tuple. And then those you know, kind of flow up through the tree to the uh, parent operators. So again, each of these you can think of as an implementation of the next function call for that uh, uh, operator. So let's, let's just go through, run through this really quickly to see uh, how, how a, a single tuple flowing through the process would look. So we're going to start here at, again, the root node. So this is the projection, and the projection is going to ask, OK, for every uh, tuple t produced from my child node, we need to call next. So we're going to come down here, call next uh, on, on the join operator. The join operator is going to say, OK, well, what I need to do is I need to call for every uh, tuple in, in the left side. We're going to uh, call that next function. Uh, and then as soon as we get one tuple, then the, the, uh, R, the table scan of R is going to, to emit or produce a single tuple that's going to flow back up to the um, join operator. So kind of this keeps going until, again, all of the tuples in R are produced. And then that first for loop, um, we, we pass back some kind of null, null uh, marker to let that for loop know to exit. So the, the first for loop exits, our hash table is built, and then we're going to do the same thing here on this uh, right side. We're going to call the next uh, function for uh, the, the selection, and then the selection is going to call the next function for the, the base table scan. And again, we want to emit up a single tuple uh, to each of these parent uh, operators here. Now, of course, in the, the, um, the case of the, the selection scan here, we're only returning tuples that match. So for example, let's say S produces several tuples that, that don't satisfy the predicate, they're, they're not greater than 100, then that uh, uh, operator at, at step four isn't going to return anything. So it's only going to return, it's only going to emit a tuple when there's a match. Okay, and then this, for every, for every single time we probe the hash table and there's a match there, we're going to emit back a tuple back to the um, parent operator, the root node, and then the, the uh, query plan's done. So are there any questions about how specifically this functions here? Okay. So uh, just to, to summarize the iterator approach, um, this is used in pretty much every uh, mainstream DBMS. Uh, it, it, it allows for, I mentioned, what's called tuple pipelining. So if you look at kind of how these these arrows look here on this right side, uh, every single tuple we emit is going to be pushed uh, or pulled by, up, up by the uh, parent operator uh, all the way through the query plan. So for f as long as you know it, it uh, let's say it, it needs to end up, the, the tuple T that we emit in step five needs to end up in our result set, it's going to be pulled through every next call all the way up through the entire query plan. 
And what that's going to allow us to do is kind of maximize the locality of the, of the data that we're working on. So remember, going and, and getting a, a, a page and then getting the tuple from the page, extracting it, decoding it, all that stuff uh, is really expensive. So basically what we want to do is maximize uh, the amount of work we're able to perform on the tuple once we go and get it from disk. So we're going to get the tuple, and we're going to try and propagate it uh, or pipeline it as much as possible through all of the operators that we have in our query plan. So that's, that's why sometimes you'll see this iterator uh, model referred to as, as a pipeline query execution model. So you also might have noticed that some queries or some operators uh, need to block until their children emit all of their tuples. So in this particular example here, uh, if I step back a few, we need to wait to execute the right side of the query, the, the probe phase of the join, until this uh, uh, left side of the query, the build phase, has emitted all of the tuples. So we need, to, we need to go over all the tuples in R and build up the hash table. And then, then only then, we can start executing the, uh, right, phase, the, the right side of the, the join, which is the probe phase. So uh, there are certain operators for which um, uh, we, we need to wait until, all of the, until the children have returned all of the, uh, the tuples. Um, and finally, the, the other thing that, that works really nicely in this approach is uh, output control. So things like a limit clause, it's really easy uh, to, to stick a limit clause in, in here. You can just essentially stick it on the top and say, I only want to call uh, the, the next function of the, the root node in my query plan. Uh, I only want to call that next function. Let's say I want to limit 10. I only have to call it 10 times. And then by that point, we know, okay, we're, we're done. We don't need to return any more tuples. So this will allow us to do some kind of um, early stopping where if we don't need more results, we can uh, ignore you know, completing the entire probe phase of the join. We don't have to do the whole thing um, because we know that we only want 10, 10 results from this query. So here are a few examples of uh, the many, many systems that, that use this iterator-based approach. Uh, there are um, certainly many more. Um, but it, it, again, as I said, it's a, it's a very common uh, paradigm because it lets you kind of break down uh, the execution of a query into these modular pieces where you only have to worry about implementing each operator individually. And then you can kind of stitch them together arbitrarily. And for example, if you wanted to add uh, a new query operator to your, uh, uh, the, the available operations in your system. Let's say, for example, that uh, you, didn't, you, you only had a sort merge join and you wanted to implement a hash join. All you need to do is implement the hash join operator uh, that, that conforms to this next iterator function call API. And then once you have that, you can just plug it into your, uh, your query plan and it, it, or your, your query execution engine, and it, it can now be used uh, just, just the same as any other operator. So that's kind of the, the nice abstraction of this iterator-based approach is uh, you can think about each operator individually in, in sort of these modular units and then, then stitch them all together to get a, an arbitrarily complex query. So uh, the, the iterator version is, uh, or the iterator approach is the first, the first uh, processing model we talked about. The second one uh, is called the materialization model. So basically what, what the materialization model is going to do is that each operator uh, is going to process all of its input all at once, and then it's going to emit the entire output all at once. So uh, this is, you may alternatively see, referred to as the operator to time model for sort of obvious reasons, but uh, basically what, what it's doing is it does all of its processing and then it materializes um, just one single result. That's the entire result set that that operator is going to produce. And then that operator is done and we never need to look at it again. So uh, the kind of the tricky thing here is that uh, there's no good way in this model to push down, for example, uh, limit operations. So in, in the, the other version, you know, we could just call next 10 times and that gets us 10 tuples and then we're done. In this case, since each operator needs to materialize its entire output, so the table scan would need to materialize its entire output all at once before moving on to the join part, um, there's no really easy way to push this down. So you need to kind of uh, pass down if you want to do some kind of early, implement some kind of early stopping, like a limit, uh, limit based approach, then you need to pass down hints through the, the operator tree or the query plan tree to make sure that 
your the 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 leaf nodes in the query plan know uh, that they can stop stop early. Um, and again, there's kind of this this uh, difference between uh, NSM versus DSM storage. So you can either materialize uh, like a full row, or if, for example, your your operator is working on an individual column, you can just materialize a single column. So we'll see some uh, examples of that later. But so the, just visually, the way this would look, uh, we we still kind of have the same. Um, uh, operator breakdown here, but rather than uh, having these next function calls that are going to return a single tuple of time, basically each, each operator is going to call, so the, the root node here is going to call its child, the join, and it's going to say, please give me all of your outputs. So that's this child.output function. And then you can iterate over all of the tuples in the uh, materialized output. So the, the root node is going to call the join, the join's going to call um, its, its left child here. So basically what's happening in this table scan now, instead of returning one tuple at a time and, and kind of pushing it so it's pipelined all the way through all the operators in the query tree, um, it, it's going to, to put all of the tuples, it's going to write them out into this uh, output buffer called out, and then once it's done, we're going to return out up to the parent. And then the same thing, sort of the, the you get all the tuples back all at once, build the hash table, and then sort of the same thing is going to happen on uh, the right side. So we have to go through here. Um, this, this table scan is going to produce all the output, return it to uh, the, the selection, and then so forth all the way up the query tree. So this is kind of the, the extreme opposite of like tuple at a time processing is operator at a time processing. So we do all of the, uh, the entire operation on every single tuple for that operator, and then we're done with it, and then we move on to the next operator. So the question is, when when would you want to do this? I said kind of why the uh, tuple tuple at a time iterator based processing was good. So the the um, answer is that sometimes in uh, uh, OLTP workloads, because we're only accessing a small number of tuples at a time. Uh, it, it might be beneficial to do this kind of materialization approach. So if we know we're only going to get a small number of tuples, we want to get all the way down to the scan, and we want to kind of fill up uh, the entire, wh while we're accessing the table, we want to get all the tuples that we're possibly going to need from the table, and then be able to push them up to the parent operator. So you're kind of uh, uh, optimizing the, the accesses and the operations that you're performing on each tuple. It's, it's much more streamlined than having to, you know, recursively sort of call all of these next functions and traverse those for every single uh, tuple you want to you want to uh, execute so the, the 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 advantage there in something like a, a high performance system um, uh, volt DB uh, which uh, Andy actually worked on the uh, the the predecessor the academic predecessor H store uh, when he was in graduate school and then they commercialized it as volt DB but kind of this is the um, uh, a one way that you can strip out a lot of the overhead of having these next function calls. VoltDB uh, is an in-memory system, so the overhead of having all these function calls kind of, kind of adds up. We've talked a little bit, you know, about kind of the, the differences uh, between in-memory versus disk-based processing. Um, for this class, we're focusing exclusively on disk-based processing, so uh, these, these function call overheads don't really matter for us. They're masked by disk I.O. stuff, but um, when you're in memory, those, those sorts of overheads start to add up. So on the other, other side of things, um, it's less good for OLAP queries because these, they typically have really large intermediate results. You have to compute you know, an entire join, materialize that. That can grow quite large. Uh, so there are some systems that do it. For example, MonetDB, um, it has these, these vectorized operator at a time uh, uh, processing engine and basically it will do, uh, so it's a, it's a column store, DSM store, and basically it will operate on an entire column, produce that output, and then that uh, column will be the input to a, a, another operator. Yes? Is the materialization model easier to work with? Do you want to aggressively pre So the, the question is, is the materialization model easier to work with if you want to aggressively prefetch pages? Uh, I think probably it makes prefetching 
easier if everything's sort of a sequential scan, but I think the, the drawback is it depends on how much um, room you have in your buffer pool uh, in memory to, to handle stuff. Because if you imagine, you know, if I have to materialize essentially the entire uh, output of, of like a table scan, right, you, you, if, if uh, my table is bigger than memory, then I'm going to end up basically just rematerializing the output, right? So, I mean, you, you probably rewrite those away at the end um, and you get some kind of streaming access. But I think the, the, the uh, imagine a join, right? If I have to materialize the entire join outputs, that means the, the whole hash table side uh, plus the build side plus on the probe side, uh, now for every match I have to emit those, that can get pretty large. So kind of you lose, you lose, I think, whatever benefits you would get through prefetching by having to do now much more disk I.O. If, if you're larger than memory. If you're in memory, then sort of the, the, the question changes. And that's why systems like MonadB can have this, this operator to time processing model. Uh, but if you're larger than memory, I, I can't think of a good uh, way to do this that's not going to um, kind of sabotage any advantages you get in that regard. Are there any other questions about uh, materialization? Okay, so uh, the last one we're going to talk about is called the vectorization model. And um, it's, it's similar to the iterator model, so each operator is going to implement a next function, but instead of uh, just returning a single tuple at a time for each call to the next function, the operators are going to emit a batch of tuples um, instead of just once. We're going to have multiple tuples. Let's say, you know, it could be uh, maybe we want to return 100 tuples at a time, 1,000, whatever. We just want to return some number greater than one uh, where, we, where we kind of batch them all together um, and, and return that to our, the, the parent that called our next function. So uh, basically the, the, the internal loop for each operator that's doing this, that's, that's implementing the next call is going to uh, batch up all of the, the results, do whatever operation we need to do on it, and then return it as the, the output of next. And the, the size, the exact size, is going to vary based on you know, your hardware or your query properties or things like that. So um, again, there are different considerations if you're in memory. Uh, for example, you might want your batch sizes to align with um, cache lines or with memory pages or something like that. But uh, basically, um, the idea is that, that we want to batch up uh, several tuples together uh, in a single batch rather than just one. Uh, can anyone think of what some of the advantages of doing that might be? Yes. Exactly. So the, the statement was that you avoid the overhead of function calls. You get to kind of amortize the cost of a next function call over several tuples rather than having to do it for every single one. You can kind of do it over several. Now, again, if you are in a situation where you're extremely disk bound or I.O. bound, then the function call overhead you know, probably doesn't matter very much. But um, if you are partially in memory or fully in memory, then this kind of uh, uh, amorti amortization of um, the, the next function call overhead over, over batches of tuples can be a potentially big win. So this is another way to get around sort of that, that function call overhead that we saw uh, with the, just the basic tuple at a time iterator approach. So this is going to look uh, kind of like a hybrid between the, the, um, uh, the iterator tuple at a time and the, the materialization approach. So Again, we have these output buffers, but rather than being the entire materialized output, there are going to be some fixed size, say 100 or 1,000 tuples at a time. And basically, we're going to keep calling um, child.next the same way that we did uh, for the iterator version. But now, basically, you know, each time we call next, we're going to get back a batch of tuples rather than just a single tuple at a time. So basically, we're filling up these uh, uh, each of these uh, output buffers out all the way down to the table scan. So, so what ha what's happening here in, in step three is uh, the, the table scan operator of R is filling up this output buffer until it gets full. If it's full, uh, then we want to emit the whole output buffer and return that, that whole tuple batch 
back to uh, the parent join operator here. So we're going to do it kind of in these batches. And then the same thing on the, the right side. So once we're all done building up the, the hash table during the uh, build phase of our hash join um, in the, that four, first for, for loop in operator two, then we move on to the uh, second, uh, second for loop in there. And, and basically for each, for each probe, uh, we're not, again, emitting the tuple right away. As soon as we find a match, we're sticking it in, the, it in this output buffer until the full output buffer fills up, and then we're going to return it. Uh, and the same thing for the, the selection in step four. We're not emitting the tuple right away. If it passes the predicate, we're putting it in the output buffer until it fills up. Um, and uh, the, there, it, you may not be, you know, whatever your batch size is might not be evenly divisible uh, by the, the uh, table size, so you may have to, you know, if you get a partially full buffer at the end, you're going to have to flush that all, all the way through the pipeline. Yes? Do you end up with uh, both uh, inefficiency where you have, like, half a batch sitting around holding memory where it's So suppose that, uh, you know, size about to be four there, um, and they both want to emit batch of size n, but four doesn't take everything that it uses. So So the, the question is, uh, can you run into problems where um, you have sort of these partially utilized batches um, uh, sitting around in, in different operators? So uh, the answer is no, based on the way that these are implemented. So if you think about what's happening here, each output buffer, uh, let's just for simplicity say that the output buffer is the same size as a page that we're going to have in our buffer pool. So we're going to allocate one page for each of these operators. So for example, the selection operator in step four allocates one page, and then the, uh, the, the table scan operator in page five, I guess, allocates one page to fill up. So basically, I guess it can fill it up by just reading in the page from disk. Now that's, that's full. So that gets passed on to, uh, so it's a single page, it gets passed on to the, the parent operator, which is the uh, selection. So now let's say that the selection filters out 50%, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to take the, the whatever 50% match, and you're going to copy those to the buffer for the selection. So now the selection is going to have a 50% filled up buffer. So that's its one page that it was allotted. Then you can throw away the, you don't need to keep around the, the ones that didn't match. Then you're going to get you know, a new page in from the table scan. So you get you know, another 50%. You're going to f copy those over to fill up your buffer. So then once your buffer's full, yeah. So you said 100% stuff in the second page, so that you wrote that. You were ready to admit your output, and you still had half the page, like half the second page left over. So, so uh, the, the question is, so let's say the, the first page you got 50% full, and then the second page you get 100%, right? So what's, let's, I mean, kind of work through here what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to copy the first 50% to your, your buffer, right? And now you're not going to do any more work. You're going to pass your buffer up to your, your parent. Your parent is going to do its work uh, all the way up to the root. It's going to return the result. And now you have your buffer page back. You just wipe it out. And now you can continue copying over the second half of that page that, that was going to be 100%. So you never wind up with sort of these half full pages hanging around. Uh, you're always kind of packing this batch or vector as full as possible. And then once you're full, you, you pass it along. So you're, you're, you're not going to have like these kind of collections of half full uh, uh, vectors or output buffers sitting around. You only ever have one, each operator has one output buffer that it's going to fill up all the way and then if it's in, so in this example, if the selection is halfway through finishing um, the, the uh, vector supplied by the table scan, it's going to stop as soon as it gets full. It's going to, to pass its output buffer to its parent. And then uh, once, once that kind of completes all the way up the tree, we're going to go back down to the, uh, the selection and it will resume 
the, the remaining 50% of the buffer that it had uh, input. Does that make sense? Uh, so the, the question is, if, if you request a batch and you get a single tuple back, um, will you just propagate that and not, not request multiple batches? So the, the way that, it's work, that, that it works is the next function call is blocking until the batch fills up. So for example, if you think about you know, what's happening from the uh, table scan in, in the, the operator 5, it's producing a bunch of tuples. So now that, that you know, like I said, there's no selection there, so it's going to you know, always produce a full batch. That, that batch is going to be sent to its parent operator. So once you get to the selection, right? the selection has some output buffer hanging around. Let's say it starts off empty. As you start filling it up, you're going to keep calling next from, from uh, the table scan operator until you get enough in your batch that it's full. And then uh, in your parent, you're going to return next because the, the, the next call for each operator blocks until the child can return a full buffer. Or if you, know, if, if you get the null thing that says you're done, you're, you're done. You give back a, you know, in the, last, the very last one, you give back a partially full buffer. But you're going to keep, uh, the, in the next function call, you don't return multiple batches. You only return one batch, but it has to be filled up by the child before it can be returned to the parent. So you, you always get back a full batch, which is why you, you, don't, you don't end up with these multiple pages hanging around. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, so the question is, do you, do you uh, flush out the, the partially full buffer at the end? Yes. So, so when, you, you know, when you get to the end of the for, after the for loop, it's not shown here for simplicity, but if, if you aren't able to fill up the buffer all the way, then you need to flush it out at the end to get you know, whatever last remaining tuples are uh, up to the parent. Yes. Are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, when is the vectorization model good? We talked about kind of the, the other two. Um, the, the vectorization model is ideal for OLAP queries in particular. So these are those analytics queries that are doing a lot of um, ad hoc joins or uh, aggregations, that kind of stuff. They're looking at a lot of data um, because it reduces the number of invocations that you have per operator. So you don't have to have all of these um, uh, uh, next function calls, we can amortize the cost of the next function calls over uh, several operators. Now, if you're doing transactional workloads, um, as I said, you know, you might, you might, you want to start working on tuples as soon as possible. So kind of waiting around to fill up these uh, buffers gives you some, you know, additional overhead that, that might not be ideal for those cases. So the other nice thing about the, the vectorization approach is that it allows uh, for operators uh, to, to more easily use uh, vectorized or SIMD instructions. So SIMD stands for single instruction, multiple data. They're basically um, CPU instructions that let you operate on several data items at once. So imagine, you know, you have a bunch of, uh, I don't know, 64-bit integers. Uh, you can pack multiple of those into a, a SIMD register. If you have a 128-bit or 256-bit SIMD register, you can fit multiple 64-bit integers into the register. Let's say you want to add one, you just issue an instruction and it adds one on all of those um, values at the same time. So you can do, depending on the SIMD register width and the, the size of the data items you're working on, you can do you know, uh, two, four, eight, however many um, of these uh, instruction or operations on data items in parallel. So uh, particularly in, in cases where you have a column store, for example, a DSM storage model, uh, and you have, let's say, all of the integers stored together in a single column, you can kind of operate on those uh, much more effectively um, using things like, like uh, SIMD. So these are a bunch of systems uh, that, that use uh, the vectorization model in, in varying ways, primarily in their 
um, OLAP or analytics. If if they are if they're multi-purpose, uh, then then this is primarily used in the uh, OLAP side of the engine rather than the transactional side of the engine. So, uh, are there any questions about either the, the vectorization model or any either of the other two um, uh, iterator or materialization before we move on to the next piece? So the question is like, so right, right here, will the, the child block until the parent calls the next operator again? Uh, yes, so, so for example, in, um, in the, uh, the, let's say the join operator, right? So the join operator is gonna call next. Uh, the child, the selection is going to fill up a full buffer and then once the buffer is full, it's gonna return that and now uh, the, the parent is going to get back a full buffer to work on. And now we're, the, the child is not going to fill up, start filling up another buffer until the parent, uh, the, the two operator there, calls next again. Are there any other questions? Okay, so um, just uh, this is a, a, a really quick point I want to make. Um, so all of the examples that I showed, the, the three different query processing models, um, all had this kind of top-down query processing paradigm. So you started at the top of the query plan, uh, you started with the root node, and that operator started calling the next, uh, the next function, the iterator function for each of its children to produce uh, results. So you, you start at the top and you kind of recursively call next all the way down the tree until you get to the leaf and then the, the data flows up um, back to the root. So this, this is uh, usually referred to as, as a pull-based model because each parent pulls the data up from uh, its children. So they're, they're, they're always being pulled up with uh, the function calls. The alternative approach, and this is uh, a lot, a lot less common uh, because it's a little bit more difficult to reason about, but there are some advantages, uh, and I'll mention a few here, but the, the alternative approach is kind of this bottom to top approach. So you start at the bottom nodes, and rather than the uh, parents pulling uh, either you know, single tuples or vectors of tuples or whatever from the children, um, the, the, the children are pushing their results that they, they compute to the parents. So this is, again, a little bit uh, counterintuitive to think about, but um, th there are some advantages. So for example, you get this kind of tighter control of uh, caching and registers uh, during your, your uh, query processing, you get much better pipelining of the data. So you can kind of keep the data, uh, rather than having to have these indirections with the function calls, you can kind of just push the data through, up through the query plan uh, through each of the operators. So. Um, I, I just wanted to point this out uh, in case uh, you, you ever see it anywhere, but uh, for the most part, uh, pretty much everyone implements this um, uh, top to bottom iterator based approach. So uh, the next thing we need to talk about is uh, access methods. So um, we've seen access methods a little bit before, particularly in talking about the differences between uh, table scans uh, versus index scans, that kind of stuff. Um, we've talked about kind of the some of the different trade-offs there, but this is gonna be really important for uh, the, the overall query execution. So an access method is basically the way that the DBMS is going to um, access the data that's, that's stored in a table. So this isn't defined um, uh, in you know the, the like logical plan or the relational algebra kind of stuff, but it, it's something that we need to consider when we're implementing the uh, physical operators that are, are going to be actually responsible for executing the uh, different pieces of the query. So there are gonna be three basic approaches to this uh, that we're gonna talk about. The first is just a sequential scan of the table. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the second is uh, kind of revisiting. We, we talked a little bit before about how to use indexes or how to leverage indexes um, for query processing. So we're gonna look at that again. And then the final piece is if you have multiple indexes hanging around, how can you kind of leverage um, more than one index to, to answer a query? 
So uh, again, the, the, we're going to start kind of with talking about the, the sequential scan for uh, these two base tables here in our, in our tables. This is how, we, how we're going to access the data that's stored in these uh, uh, t uh, tables. So the, the sequential scan is pretty straightforward. Basically, for each page in the table, we're going to you know, go through the buffer pool to get it, get it back. And then we're going to iterate over each tuple and, and uh, check whether we should include it. So you can kind of push down the selection piece into this table scan so that we don't have to, uh, in, in the previous examples, you know, every time we were calling, um, uh, every, every time we wanted to call, for example, the selection in that query, uh, we then had to go and, and call um, the, the next function of the uh, uh, table scan, which is always just going to return a tuple. Um, and in the, you know, the vectorized or the materialized version, uh, it doesn't make sense to kind of repeat the work of, of uh, fetching the, the tuple, so we might as well just push down this uh, selection predicate into the uh, table scan. So again here, we're, for each page in the table, for each tuple in each page, we're evaluating the predicate, uh, and if it, if it matches, then we're going to do something. Either we're going to, if it's a tuple at a time processing, we're going to emit it right away. Or if it's vectorized processing, we're going to fill up some kind of output buffer and then uh, return that. So the, the uh, DBMS is basically going to implement this as uh, an internal cursor that's going to check uh, or track the last page and slot that it examined. So it's going to keep track, it, it basically it's going to maintain its own internal iterator to, to keep track of this. So there are all sorts of optimizations um, that, that we can perform to kind of speed up uh, 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 sequential scans of, of tables. Um, it's, it's usually, depending on what the query is, it's usually not a very efficient way to execute it. So for example, if I want just a single tuple somewhere, uh, and I have an index, usually you know, I, it's, it's much faster for me to go look it up in the index and get it back that way, versus um, if, I, if I have to do a sequential scan to go over the whole table, find just the one tuple I'm looking for and return it, uh, it's, it's uh, a, a lot of wasted work. So maybe in things like where there's no selection condition or where um, you, you need to kind of aggregate over, over many things, you need to look at the whole table, uh, or if you don't have an index and you have to look, kind of look at everything, um, you, uh, uh, you know, have no choice but to do this. But uh, there, are, there are still a, a bunch of ways that we can speed up sequential scans over uh, a table. So a few of these we've talked about already. For example, prefetching, you know, you can uh, prefetch or pre-request, uh, get, get uh, pages from disk that you know you're going to need in the future. Um, you know, if I'm on page I right now, I can get page I plus one uh, ready in the buffer pool waiting for me, so I don't have to block on I.O. for that. Um, the, the buffer pool bypass thing we talked a little bit about where you have kind of a, rather than going through the usual buffer pool mechanisms, you have sort of a, a separate um, just a buffer area that you can fill up with intermediate results for your query. Uh, we also talked a little bit about uh, um, uh, parallelization, but we'll cover that more uh, in, in next class when we talk about how to kind of parallelize uh, overall query. Uh, uh, the, the parallelize all aspects of the, the query. So the, the three things I want to focus on here are um, these three heap clustering, zone maps, and uh, late materialization. So uh, let's start with zone maps. Uh, a zone map, uh, sometimes um, you might see it called a, a small materialized aggregate, SMA. Um, but, but as far as I know, everyone colloquially calls it zone maps. Uh, I think it's, I, I don't know if it's like trademarked by Oracle or something, but that might be why uh, it, it doesn't show up in, in formal documentation, but um, everyone calls it zone maps. Basically, it's pre-computed aggregates for um, the attribute values in a page. So you're looking at all the attribute values in a page, and you're pre-computing some kind of aggregates about it, so you don't have to uh, necessarily access the page. You can check and decide whether or not you want to access the page before you have to go and get it. So uh, basically, you know, we can store this zone map for this original data stored in the page, and the zone map's going to keep around statistics, statistics like the min value, the max value, average sum, count, that kind of stuff. And then um, if, if we want to uh, execute some query like this, for example, so 
uh, we're filtering out from the, the table scan all of the um, tuples where value is greater than or val is greater than uh, 600. In this case, we can just look at the zone map. You don't even have to access the data in the page. Um, but uh, because we can decide, see, okay, right away, there are no values in this page that are um, uh, greater than 600. The, the max value that we have in this page is 400. So we don't even have to look at the page. Uh, typically, these are um, uh, stored in some kind of separate zone maps page. Um, Otherwise, you know, you, you're, you're kind of already paying the, the disk I.O. penalty. If, if it's stored, for example, in the header part, you know, uh, we, we talked about how um, the, the disk pages can have a header at the front that stores some kind of me uh, metadata inf information about the page. Uh, if you're storing the zone map in the header, um, you, you're kind of already paying the price of having to go and do the disk I.O. to get the page to look at the zone map. So. Uh, it, it probably saves you less there. It, it may still save you from having to uh, iterate over the tuples, you know, decode the, uh, if you have variable length tuples, look in the slot array and kind of do all that stuff. But um, if, if, uh, if, you, if you store zone maps instead in some kind of zone map page, then you can, or, uh, you know, zone map table, some separate uh, sort of buffer that keeps all of these zone maps together, then um, you, you can exclude these, these I.O. fetches for pages in the table scan that you know you don't even need to look at. So as I said, there are, there are several systems that uh, use this. I, don't, I think only Oracle officially calls them zone maps, but basically they're, they're, all these systems are doing the same thing. Uh, they're storing these, these materialized aggregates somewhere so that they can prune out or exclude pages that they don't even need to, to read in to look at. So are there any questions about um, how's, how zone maps function? Can anyone tell me one big problem with zone maps? What's an issue here if we have, you know, this, yes? Correct. So the statement is every time you uh, update the page, either you update the value in a tuple or you add a new tuple to the page or you delete a tuple, you have to go and update the zone map. And again, that's you know, easier if it's uh, stored in the page because you already have the page there to work on it. But otherwise, if it's stored in the separate kind of zone map page, then you have to go and update it somewhere else. So kind of it, it adds the, it, it, it lets you um, uh, prune out pages early that you don't need to look at, so that's a big win there, but it also adds the complexity during uh, writes that you have to go and keep, keep the zone map in sync with the original data. So kind of uh, th there's this trade-off again between uh, fast writes, fast inserts, updates, deletes, versus um, fast reading. So uh, another optimization uh, we can apply relates to late materialization. Um, so DSM DBMSs can delay stitching together tuples until the upper parts of the query plan. So uh, remember DSM is the, the column store model. So all of the values in an individual column are stored together. Uh, so when we're accessing a page, we're actually getting all of the uh, values for a particular column from a whole bunch of different uh, tuples. So we get all those values, and let's say we're just doing a selection, we can select out the parts that we don't want. Uh, so for example here, uh, in this, this query plan, um, all we need for the output is C. So if we're in uh, uh, an entry or, or row-based storage model, then we have, you know, we would get all the A, B, and C values all together. If we're in this uh, DSM storage model, then in our query plan here, um, what we can do is, uh, you know, just for the selection here, we're going to grab just the, the column that I need. So it's going to be just A that's going to get pushed up to my uh, selection operator there. And then the offsets of the rows that match. So, for example, let's say uh, rows or tuples 0 and 2 match. We're going to pass those offsets up to the parent rather than uh, the actual values themselves. So then, again, with the join, we're going to perform the join on this B column. We know, you know, we just need to look at uh, offsets 0 and 2. We're going to pass those offsets up to the, um, the average based on whatever joined. 
And then we're just going to grab the uh, C column here in order to produce the final result with whatever offsets match uh, based on our, our um, earlier operators. So does this make sense? Are there any questions about this? Okay, an index scan. Um, the, we've talked a little bit about this before, so I don't want to spend too much time on it um, here, but basically the idea is that the, uh, the DBMS um, needs to or can pick an index uh, to find tuples for the query. Rather than having to scan the whole table, if you have an index sitting around, you can leverage that to get just to the, the queries, or sorry, to the tuples that you want uh, based on the, the selection conditions uh, specified by the query. So which index to use is a really hard problem. It depends on all sorts of things. Um, you know, what attributes the index contains, what attributes the query references. Uh, those are sort of obvious, you know, if you don't have an index on a uh, attribute that's needed in the query, then it doesn't help you. Um, the attribute values, uh, uh, the, uh, the, how the predicate is composed, and whether or not the index is a unique or a non-unique index. So uh, again, this is a really complex sort of uh, decision. Um, we're going to talk about it, uh, how, how actually to decide uh, between all these different options you have, potential options you have in lecture 13 uh, when we talk about kind of query optimization. So uh, here we're just gonna focus on actually how you implement or how you would implement uh, an index scan. In particular, um, Let's say we have this uh, uh, example query here. So um, imagine there's you know, a single table with 100 tuples and we have two indexes. Index number one is gonna be on age and index number two is gonna be on department. So uh, we're gonna execute this query. We can either, you know, we have, we have these two indexes to choose from. Uh, which one do we wanna use? So we have this table here those are the two indexes and this query. We want to select star from students where all those predicates. Which, which index should we use? Yes? So the, the answer is whichever one is most selective. Uh, so that is correct. So uh, basically what that means is it's going to depend on the exact data that we have. If, for example, age is less than 30 is more selective then we We'll make one decision if department equals CS is more selective, we want to um, uh, make a different decision. So, for example, in scenario number one, um, if there are 99 people under the age of 30, but only two of them in the CS department, we would want to use the CS index. Yes, okay. So, uh, we, we use index number two on department to get back only those two people in CS, and then, you know, filter out uh, the, the people that, that are over the age of 30. Now suppose we have this other scenario where uh, there are 99 people in the CS department but only two people under the age of 30. Obviously we wanna instead use uh, index number one on age to filter out you know, everyone uh, who's above 30 and then we can, we can uh, perform the, the last checks for the, the 99 people in the CS or the, to filter out the remaining people in the CS department. So, this is kind of having, forcing us to choose between one of the two indexes that we have. Uh, another option that we might have is what's called a multi-index scan. So um, you may see this referred to as a bitmap scan. I think that's what it's called in Postgres. Um, but uh, basically the, the idea is that if there are multiple indexes that the DBMS can use for a query, then we can use all of them. The way that we're going to do that is uh, we're going to compute the sets of record IDs uh, using each matching index, and then we're going to combine the sets based on the predicates. So if it's, uh, if it's a, an AND um, uh, conjunction, then we're going to use an intersection of the record IDs. If it's an OR with a disjunction, then we're going to use a union of the record IDs. And then we're, we're able to, at the end, retrieve all the records that apply uh, and, and you know, apply any, any remaining uh, predicates or operations that we have in the query plan. So kind of we use multiple indexes, uh, get the values that we need from each of them independently, and then combine the, the resulting record IDs together. So uh, just a, a, as an example, using this um, uh, previous uh, example query, um, if we have an index on age and uh, an index on department, 
then uh, we're going to retrieve all, and, and, and we want to use both indexes, we can retrieve the record IDs uh, from the, the age index satisfying ages less than 30, so we get all those record IDs. Then we independently retrieve all the record IDs for uh, department equals CS using the, the department index, and then we take the intersection of the two because here we want the, the AND. And then the last step is to, we don't have an index on country, so we want to uh, retrieve the, the records and, and check the final uh, country equals US. So there are many different ways uh, to implement this. You can do it using bitmaps where you know, the, the record ID is each bit is set if the record uh, needs to, to go through in the, the result. You can do it using hash tables, you can do it using bloom filters, and then uh, since bloom filters are, are probabilistic, um, have some you know, final check that, that uh, double checks to make sure that uh, it should actually be included. So there are, there are different ways to implement this, but the basic idea is that you're, you're producing the record IDs from um, each index independently, and then what we want is the, uh, the, the intersection of the two, and then we're going to fetch those records that are at the intersection and perform the final uh, selection step on country equals US. So are there any questions about uh, this? Yes. So the question is, how do you know which index is more selective without querying it? Uh, so uh, the, the way that the DBMS is going to, to um, know about this is by maintaining statistics about uh, the different tables and attributes that are stored in the database. So the DBMS is going to have essentially in the catalog that, that contains all of the information about the tables and the columns that you have, uh, it's going to maintain also statistics about the distribution. So for example, age, you might build a histogram over the ages uh, that you store in your uh, catalog for department. You might store the um, the distinct departments, so CS, biology, English, whatever, and then a count associated with them. So you can kind of build these histograms that give you uh, statistics, and these are going to be really important uh, during query optimization. So when you're deciding, should I do you know, plan A or plan B, they're, they're both equivalent, they're going to give me the same result, but if you know something about the selectivity of different uh, statements, for example, you may decide to, to, to uh, execute one over the other. So I, I kind of, in the, the high level introduction here, I said that there are all these different things that are going to factor into the decision, um, and we'll talk more about them in the query optimization uh, lecture. But the, the, the high level idea is that the DBMS maintains statistics about all these things, and they may not be you know, exactly accurate, they could be outdated, so um, there, there are usually these uh, um, commands you can issue analyze commands on the, the command line and you can tell the DBMS to go, like Postgres, go update your statistics that are stored in your catalog. So it kind of keeps these statistics uh, as, as rough um, uh, counts or histograms in order to figure out uh, how to do join ordering, how to do index selection, all those different problems, um, how to do, decide which order to evaluate predicates in, all those sorts of different problems that will come up in, in query optimization. Does that answer your question? Great. Okay, so uh, again, I, I said that kind of we've, we've spoken mostly about uh, read queries, so equally important are modification queries. Uh, basically, there are the operators that implement the insert, update, and delete functions of um, SQL. So uh, kind of the, the the important thing to remember here is that each of these implementations, when we Im implement the, the insert or update or delete operator, um, we're, we're responsible in that operator for checking any constraints that we have in the query. So for example, if um, it's, we have a primary key constraint, all of those values need to be unique. So we have to check uh, to make sure that that's, that's true. We can't um, uh, let you know non-unique values get inserted in that case. So the insert operator needs to implement some kind of check uh, for that case. Similarly, if you have you know um, other uh, constraints in your your 
database, like uh, everyone's salary needs to be greater than zero or something, we can have negative salaries, then um, the, whoever is performing a, a write operation needs to make sure that that constraint is, is going to hold true. The other thing that these operators need to do is uh, update indexes. So we talked about uh, just a few slides ago how it's important to maintain the uh, zone map values, the aggregate values that are stored in zone maps, uh, and make sure that those are synchronized with the uh, base data stored in the tables, and it's the same for indexes. The indexes need to um, match what we have stored in the tables. So we can't have you know, something in the table that's not in the index, and uh, likewise, we can have something in the index that's not yet stored in the table. So these operators need to be responsible for kind of maintaining that uh, synchronization. So um, the, the, the two sort of uh, uh, operators that fit together are update and delete. Um, basically, uh, you, you can think about it as the, the child operators pass the record IDs for whatever the target tuples are. So these can fit in, you know, in the query plan just like uh, other operators, like a projection, for example. Uh, they can fit in the query plan and they're going to have this stream of, of uh, tuples uh, passed to them however they have, for example, uh, either a single tuple at a time, vector at a time, whatever. Um, but those are going to be uh, uh, kind of streamed to the uh, update and delete operations and it's going to be important for them to keep track of previously seen tuples. So uh, we'll see an example of that in, in a minute, but um, that's, that's how update and delete work. For insert, you sort of have two choices for how you want to implement it. So choice number one is that you can either materialize the tuples inside the operator, uh, which means basically, you know, say I want to insert these tuples, uh, those values get, uh, uh, or sorry, I want to insert tuples with these values, they get constructed, put in the operator, um, and then, then pushed up to uh, whatever, you know, index updates or uh, constraint checking needs to happen. The other option is uh, that, that the operator could insert any tuple that's passed in from child operators. So you kind of can decouple it in this way, um, which will, would allow you to implement something, for example, like uh, select into. So for example, you want to select all the values in a particular table that match some predicate and insert them into another table. Uh, choice number two would allow you to, to do that. So it's a little bit more flexible than uh, the, the first option. So, I mentioned the, uh, the update query problem. So imagine that we have um, this uh, situation here. We have an index uh, by salary on the, the people um, in our people table. Uh, and we're gonna update people and says salary, uh, we're gonna give them all a $100 raise um, in the table if they make less than 1,100 currently. So uh, basically our, our scan on the bottom is for every uh, uh, tuple T in people, we're going to emit T up to the, the parent there, and then we're going to, to do the um, uh, processing. So for every T that we get back, we're going to remove uh, the tuple from the index, update the tuple, and then put it back in the index. So parent, again, is going to call the, the child operator here, and we have this index uh, on, on people.salary. We're going to start scanning from the beginning. So uh, we're, let's say this is our range here. We want everyone who's less than 1,100. We're going to start at the lowest salary and then work up until we get to uh, 1,100. So uh, let's say our first value here is Andy, and he makes a salary of 999. So we're going to return that from our scan up to the uh, parent here, the update uh, operator. The update operator is going to perform the, the operation that we want here. So in this case, it's going to uh, give him a raise of 1,100. So, or sorry, he's gonna give him a raise of 100, so now he's gonna be, he's gonna be making 1,099. He's gonna get inserted uh, in this final step back into the index, so he's now back in the index. So, as we proceed through the index, what we might find is we get to this tuple, Andy, who is still less than 11, 1,100 here, and now he's going to get read in again, returned by our uh, index scan, and now we're going to give him another raise, which, uh, frankly, I don't think he deserves. So now he's getting uh, uh, $1,199 when he already got his uh, $100 raise. So this is, this is a, a problem in, in uh, update queries 
It's called the Halloween problem. Uh, if you ask why it's called the Halloween problem, it has nothing to do with the specifics of the problem. It's because the researchers who were uh, who noticed this um, uh, from IBM, they were working on this. And I think uh, it, they they discovered it on Halloween Day in 1976. It was like a Friday, uh, and they said, "Wow, that's a really uh, interesting problem." And then they said, "Okay, it's Friday. Let's uh, you know solve it next week." So uh, that's why it's called the Halloween problem. Um, nothing exciting about the specifics of the problem, just the day on which it was uh, uh, discovered. So. Uh, basically, it's this anomaly, uh, to, to summarize, this anomaly where an update operation can change like the physical location of a tuple. So in that example, um, you're updating the uh, uh, salary so it gets repositioned in the index, uh, which causes the scan operator to visit that tuple multiple times. And then you end up with kind of these anomalies where uh, you can end up updating the, the same operator multiple times. I think in the original uh, Halloween formulation of the problem, um, they found that you know, they wanted to uh, uh, give everyone a raise who was uh, less than $25,000 or something, and then um, if, if you, once you got to $25,000, uh, they, they didn't want to give you a raise anymore. So what they found, they ran the query, and what they found out was that the end result was that everyone in the, the table was making $25,000 at the end, because what kept happening was people uh, kept getting returned to the update operator while they were less than twenty-five thousand. So they kept getting getting raises until uh, they all, you know, capped out at whatever the the max salary was. So, are there any questions about um, uh, the Halloween problem or or uh, updates uh, rights in general? Okay, we have one more thing to cover. So. Uh, Expression evaluation is basically uh, how the DBMS is going to represent the where clause in the expression tree. So we have this uh, e expression tree here, or sorry, we have this query here. Um, we're referring specifically to this piece. Uh, so let's say this, this join uh, RID equals SID is in the where clause, and then the, the S value is greater than 100. So um, the, the we, as I mentioned, we can represent arbitrarily complex expressions. We can have comparisons. We can have conjunctions, disjunctions, uh, any kinds of these operators, plus, minus, times, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we can have constant values. So here we have the constant value 100. And we can have uh, tuple attribute references, so s dot value. So we kind of can have arbitrarily complex um, uh, uh, expressions. And the way we're going to represent this is as what's called an expression tree. So we're going to take this um, clause here and we're going to turn it into an AND. So we want both of these conditions to be true. We want both RID to equal SID. And we also want S value to be greater than 100. So in this case, the way that we can uh, uh, formulate this all the way down to the, the uh, leaf nodes is as a tree. So on the left side of the tree is the equals, which does the RID equals SID. And on the right side is the, uh, the greater than. And then, of course, it'll be combined in the AND uh, operator at the root node, which is going to, to, to be the uh, intersection of the two. So uh, kind of the, the way to think about this is um, ha that we need to have this execution context. So uh, basically, what, what uh, we can do here is parameterize the values of the query in this way. So let's say we have some kind of prepared statement here, which allows us to pass in arbitrary values. Um, we need to have kind of this, this uh, uh, context that tells us how to evaluate the different operators at the different layers of the tree and the different nodes. So we're going to start out you know, at the equals. We, we go down the left side here. We need to you know, get the value attribute s.value. We need to retrieve that. It's going to tell us, you know. The, the table schema here, here's what Ness is. We have to decode all that stuff. Fetch the current values uh, uh, for S that we're working on. So we have that tuple stored kind of in our context there. Um, in this case, it's 1,000, let's say. And then we're going to traverse down this side of the tree. We have to get parameter 0, let's say, is 999. And then uh, some constant value is 1. So kind of th this is, this is uh, how we need to kind of proceed across the whole tree in order to, then we start you know, working our way back up. We can evaluate parameter 0 is 999 plus constant 1 gives us 1,000. And now we get back to the top and we say, OK, this is true. 1,000 equals 1,000. So kind of this is really flexible 
because it's, it's going to let us evaluate an arbitrary um, expression, but it's really slow. So the, the DBMS is going to have to traverse this tree for every single, uh, uh, every single tuple, and then for every single node, uh, in this example, every single tuple, we're gonna have to do this whole tree traversal um, to evaluate the predicate. So for every single node, we have to figure out you know, what the operator needs to do with that node. So this is just a really simple example um, you know, where one equals one. That's obviously true. So uh, the, you know, there, are different, there are different ways around how we can um, avoid the overhead of having to evaluate these expression trees every time. Uh, many times you can simplify expression trees. So for example, in this case, you know, at the high level query optimization rewriting phase, we can say, okay, I know that one equals one, so let's just replace that with true. Uh, sort of things like that a compiler might do when it's compiling your code. Uh, or for example, you know, if you're, if you're saying, okay, I want to do one plus one, uh, we know that's going to evaluate to two, two we can replace that uh, with just the constant two rather than this, this plus expression. So an alternative way that some uh, higher performance systems use um, is to evaluate expressions directly. So uh, they, they may use some kind of JIT compilation or something where they can generate uh, explicitly uh, the code that matches whatever this expression tree is. So they don't have to you know, traverse the tree and evaluate each node. They can just kind of um, emit exactly the code that they want to execute for uh, the, the equivalent expression tree. So as I said, you know, this is one equals one. We know that that's true. Uh, so we can just kind of um, uh, eliminate that from our uh, uh, query plan. So are there any questions about uh, expression evaluation? And then we'll just wrap up really quickly. Okay, so uh, to conclude, um, the same query plan uh, as we've seen can be executed in multiple different ways and this is going to be um, a big deal when we talk about query optimization, deciding you know, if we have multiple uh, equivalent query, uh, query plans that are going to give us the same answer, which one is more efficient to execute. We've already seen that a little bit uh, in deciding you know, the join order, whether we should uh, uh, have one table be the outer table versus another. Um, but it's going to become even more complex when we're looking at all of the operators in a query plan. Uh, most DBMSs, as I said, will want to use uh, some type of index scan as much as possible rather than a full table scan. Let's you get down to, for a, a large class of queries, let's you get down to just the tuples that you want rather than uh, having to scan through you know, a full table and throw away most of the tuples that you don't want. Uh, and finally, expression trees, which we just talked about here at the end, are very flexible. You can get an arbitrary um, e predicate or expression that you want to evaluate, but they're very slow to have to evaluate. So uh, next class, we're going to continue talking about uh, query execution, specifically about how to parallelize the different operators that we've seen here. So I will see you next class. Talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Need for a mic check, bust it. The bees are set to grab a 40. The put him to yoga, snap his neck, St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the dump.